Following the passage of the Railway Act 1921, there was much concern that it hadn't been as effective as hoped for. The railways were still suffering from profitability issues, and the government was again forced to consider the possibility that they might have to be nationalised outright. Throughout the 1920s and 30s, various thoughts and proposals were put forward on how this might be achieved. And in the end, the ungrouped public transport in London was chosen as the prototype and the testbed for possible forms of nationalisation in the UK. In 1933, a new form of organisation, the London Passenger Transport Board, was brought into being in order to own the public transport infrastructure of London in the name of the state. Today in Rails to Nowhere, we'll be exploring the journey of how the decision to create this body was reached and the impact of that act as we continue our journey on looking at the history of London's transport in the 1930s. Hello and welcome to Rails to Nowhere. My name, as ever, is Simon, but I am not today joined by my usual co-host of Ella. Unfortunately, she's got a family emergency, which means that she's unavailable for recording. But I've called in my good friend and fellow historian, Aaron Oliver, to join us today. Hello, Aaron. Hi, everyone. Hi, Simon. Nice to have you on the show. I've wanted to invite you on for a little while. Didn't expect to have to call you in so quickly as an emergency, but excellent to have you here. And in today's episode, we are moving on with the conversation that me and Ella started in the last episode about the history of London's public transport in the 1920s and 30s. And we are moving forward to well, 90 years ago, um, almost exactly 90 years ago now, with the passage of the London Passenger Transport Act and the creation of the London Passenger Transport Board. A topic which me and Aaron both familiar with London Underground and London Transport History, so hopefully a good uh, discussion today yes hopefully yeah i mean certainly from talks of your dissertation when you were in it and when you were around it lots of uh, interesting uh, conversations that we had at the national archives i remember for example oh yes uh, aaron has been most helpful with the creation of my dissertation as <laughs> a good sounding board for it just in case you're wondering um yes there is a difference to the audio today Ella has the fancy soundboard, so I'm recording today's podcast on my computer and Aaron doesn't have a nice podcasting microphone like me and so it's in a slightly echoier space. Um, so hopefully the quality of the conversation will be enough to um, not detract um, from the uh, any echoes and less good sound quality than we're used to. Yes, yeah, so we finished off the last episode in... 1914-1918 with the First World War, with the creation of the Yerkes Tubes, the foundation of the first sort of sense of a network emerging in London, and today we're sort of going to talk through the 1920s, skimming over it a little bit because realistically I have been focusing on the 1930s for my dissertation, but it's important to understand the 1920s, to understand the passage of the London Passenger Transport Act and the creation of of the London Passenger Transport Board. For a little bit of background, the London Passenger Transport Board is the first time that all public transport in London is brought under a single organisation, and it is a government organisation in this case. Um, so we're eliminating the net private operators. I've always found the LPTB to be a weird one to understand how it actually functioned and what it actually was. But some of the research I've done more recently than my dissertation actually has pointed me to the direction that it's what we would now probably call a quango. And it's basically like the BBC in its sort of structure and setup and relationship with the state. A lot of people would naturally just immediately think it's nationalisation and it's very simple in that it goes from a private organisation, separate companies, separate concerns, into a nationalised organisation and that's that. But I think the nuance is there, the LPTB being effectively a continuation of the old public companies uh, yeah. into what effectively still kind of suits the management and there's not really much change at the top. So it's, 
it's almost yeah. there's a lot of continuity there and at the same time it's those pressures I think of the 1920s that, that lead into this it kind of stays like that for a little while uh, after 33 which I'm sure we'll kind of discuss and talk about as well yeah exactly because the key figures um, who we introduced um, in the last episode so Frank Pick and Lord Ashfield they stay as chairman and director of the LPTB in similar roles to the ones they'd held at the UERL. So there is that continuation specifically between the UERL and the LPTB. And as I say, it's state corporation. So it is a corporation like any other business, but it's owned by the state. So it's functioning much more like the BBC does in that it gets money from the government but then it does its own thing with it, much less like how following 1948 we'll see British Rail operate, where the government actually is directing it a lot more and actually having a say in how things... And this series doesn't necessarily deal with the abolition of the London Passenger Transport Board. That will be a future episode, though at some point that is kind of one of the problems it always struggles with because it's taking government money but there's actually very little government oversight of the activities of the board it is very much the lptb doing what they want to do and just taking government money and spending it i think that comes in most uh, evidently with the piccadilly line extension out to cockfosters for example it's something that they've really always wanted to do a kind of yeah. stopped from doing because of the private nature of the railways yeah. and then get through this they're able really to then and just continue those aims uh, through into the 30s. Yeah, and that's certainly something that's going to come up in two, three, three episodes time when hopefully Ella will be back and we'll be talking about the new works programme and that is very much a sort of continuation of policies from the UERL into the 1930s. So where does this idea for the LPTB come from? Because it doesn't just come out of nowhere. Now, for those of you who've listened way back, nearly two, three years ago now, to the very first episode of Rails to Nowhere, we discussed the Railway Act 1921 and the creation of the big four companies with that legislation. So following the creation of the UERL in the early 1900s by um, Charles Tyson Yerkes, the organisation forms what becomes known as the Underground Group and eventually becomes known as the Combine because it begins buying up more than just underground lines. It's beginning to combine modes of operation. It's bringing in the buses and the trams, at least in some parts of London, under the control of the UERL. And it has its eyes on all of the buses and all of the trams and all of the underground. But it does struggle through the 1920s to actually form that monopoly. But we see the 1920s really as a period of actually quite fierce competition for monopolising London's public transport because everyone wants a monopoly at least in their area or their specific mode and the UERL had kind of been formed out of fights for monopoly. Yerkes himself had sought to monopolise the Chicago streetcars and that's actually one of the reasons he'd been forced out of Chicago because that had been rejected. See the upcoming bonus episode on Charles Yerkes. And when he came to London, he wasn't the only financier that came to London. J.P. Morgan and Lord Rothschild were also major financiers trying to get a foothold in the early underground. And so in the 1900s, with the formation of the UERL, there's a lot of competition about whose proposals for underground lines are going to get built. And it is Yerkes, the Bakerloo, the Piccadilly and the Hampstead Tubes that get constructed. And that, as I mentioned last episode, brings in the first sort of... Uh, tube lines and underground lines in London because of course we've got the Metropolitan Line it's a single line you've got the District Railway that's a single line the opening of the UERL lines is your first network with a cross London identity you've got the Leslie Green stations and the sort of similar design and following the First World War the UERL is being led by our key cast for this episode, Lord Ashfield and Frank Pick, who have been appointed to the UERL pre-First World War. Pick as assistant to the then managing director, George Gibb, who he'd worked with on the North Easterly, and Albert Stanley as a consultant initially to try and improve the financial position of the railway, but later moving into the managing director position. And both rising up, so after the First World War, Ashfield becomes chairman of the organisation 
and Frank Pick moves up through the publicity department and up towards managing director and into the vice chairmanship of the LPTB when that is formed. Right, which is, of course, where we get all of the kind of iconic yeah. aspects of the underground, or at least that procession of, of monopolisation almost, this idea that yeah. actually we got, we're a big we're a big company. We may be quite small in terms of actual market, but we're quite a big uh, thinking organisation, which yeah. is where I think this monopolisation, they kind of act like it from the beginning. Um, yeah. Even though they're kind of structured and set up in the early days as quite separate, very separate companies, they act as one with these three lines and then with the district as well. They, they kind of are able to put that might behind yes. themselves. And it's, and it, it's certainly Ashfield and that continuity and, and Pick that are, are right there, really. Yeah, because Pick is really instrumental in pushing for the creation of a corporate identity. We'll talk a little bit more about this. We've got an episode coming up slightly later in the series on creating the identity of London. And he really begins to push this idea that the UERL is London's public transport. Even though you've got the London County Council running tramways, you've got West Ham as the example of the biggest other municipal tramway, but there are municipal tramways all over London. The bus companies are basically all in private hands. And it's the bus companies that are really instrumental in the move towards the creation of a single organisation to run London's public transport. Because back in our first episode, and in several of our other episodes, we've talked about how following the First World War, there is an influx of motor vehicles, and specifically heavier motor vehicles, and people licensed to drive them. Because the First World War trains a lot of people in how to drive trucks and buses and tanks, although you can't drive a tank around the streets of London, they then come back and they've got this new skill to drive motor vehicles. In terms of goods transport, you then suddenly have a lot of army surpluses that are available for people to move goods around. We talked about that in our first episode. But in London, you get a lot of people who can now just set up a small bus company with one people running one or two vehicles and just like set up a route to drive it. It was this kind of stuff that was the most worrying, I think, for the LER, for yeah. them in, in the 20s, well, post First World War in the 20s, because they were much more adaptable. A set yeah. set of routes, you can only do so much with it. And if you have a big organisation, you have to have those set routes, because if you're running 400 bus routes, they have to be set. You can't be moving mm, yeah, them all the absolutely. time. You should just have chaos within your organisation. So coming in with these kinds of very adaptable one-man bands, if you like, the best route, I think, that comes to mind in London is driving along the Marylebone Road, that kind of axis. Yeah. East, West, Paddington, it's following parts of the Metropolitan Railway at the time. It is taking away from the receipts of these railways, of the underground, and that yeah. creates a problem which almost gives them a reason to want to be monopolistic or at least to project that that's what they... Um, and that's yeah. their kind of reasoning for why they should be, because they, they should be profitable or they should be uh, London's answer to transport. And therefore, these kind of one man bands don't exactly. fit that. And I think it's telling just how much of a problem the UERL saw these new bus operators and how much they wanted to garner public support against them. But we still, if you go to the London Transport Museum or books like those by War, um, Christian Warmer and look at their entries and what they talk about for these bus operators, in this period, we, still all these sources use the language of the UERL at the time of referring to them as pirate buses. Pirate buses, it's quite an interesting image that, isn't it? Really tells you the, the depth of the propaganda that the UERL is putting out to sort of cast these people as being outlaws and needing to be eliminated because they're doing bad stuff. Whereas I think bringing a bit of chaos to the transport network maybe isn't great, but they are bringing cheaper services and they're bringing services that are more responsive to what people want which is why they do very well sounds very disruptive and it sounds almost very kind of a modern yeah i don't like modern tech bro language but they are very much the disruptor technology of the day they are very much of that i'm in agreement with you i don't really kind of love that that whole language but they are doing or they are at least purporting to do and they are shaking up in some in some sense the abilities for these more established companies really to do what they want and yeah. it does naturally it's not a, you know I'll have many thoughts on this in terms of economics but it does serve to almost drive down prices and it does yeah. allow a lot more people to choose it's almost a lot more democratic in a sense but it doesn't yes. it doesn't lead to well it leads to chaos if you have a whole lot you know how are you meant to know what you're getting in terms of service in terms of yeah. 
all sorts of aspects. So it's not great from that perspective, but it certainly does shake the market up and makes the UERL behave in a certain way. It pushes them towards a certain action. And the UERL's response is that we need to be institutionalising more transport in London and preferably we should be institutionalising it all under the UERL, preferably as a private money-making business making money for its shareholders. So we think about Pick and Ashfield as being these great champions of civic transport and providing a transport system for London, but actually the key thing with both of them is they're really good at providing a business that works for their shareholders. Be that in the early years the shareholders of the UERL or in the later years the sole shareholder of the LPTB which is the state their key thing is they're actually just they're looking out for the people who actually are funding them and what they want so at this stage they very much want the UERL to keep making money for its shareholders because that's who's telling them to make money and they want to stop the pirate buses so in 1921 with the creation of the big four companies uh, under the Railway Act 1921, there is talk and suggestion of creating a London region. I mentioned this briefly back in episode one. I didn't go into any detail because I knew this was coming up. There's talk of creating the London region, which would at the very least group together the Metropolitan Railway, the UERL, and probably most of the suburban services within London into a new region. So it would have been the big five instead of the big four. The Metropolitan Railway and the UERL both dislike the terms they're offered. As far as I can tell, basically because the terms say that they would be more even than what like they both want to be the one taking over the other and the terms they're offered basically wouldn't have either be the dominant in fact if you're bringing in the suburban services of the mainline companies in london that's the much bigger aspect of that london group and neither of them particularly likes being the little partner in a proposed merger that's my reading of the history I think that that's fair. I mean, I think that that goes back as well. Um, when you the Met are always slightly uneasy with their status, yeah. they they always want to be considered as this kind of big mainline company. When they are an underground railway company, there is their kind yes. of very well known rivalry with the district, which of course comes under UERL in in 1902 or thereabouts. So there is lots of rivalry. You can really see why the UERL wouldn't want to be the kind of junior partner in any organisation. They're very, very big as they're in status. And the Met are still really holding on to this idea that they are going to project even further out and further into unknown territories. We have to remember the Met is still in full-fledged pushing out into Metroland. It is the Stanmore branch is still opening in 1933 as the Met's last hurrah. And as you say, at least the interesting juxtaposition that in 1921, the Metropolitan Railway basically says, we are a local railway, we shouldn't be incorporated in the Big Four. And then in 1933, they try pulling the complete reverse argument of, but we want to be a mainline intercity company, so we shouldn't be included in the London passenger transport board we should be allowed to just be our own thing which doesn't work for them the second time round um so following the railway act in 1921 as we discussed back in episode one that it doesn't really solve many of the problems of the railway it solves some of them because it brings the railways together into big companies and there is some level of consolidation but it doesn't solve a lot of the problems mostly because actually the government didn't really understand what was the problems for the railway at the point that the act was passed and so actually quite quickly afterwards the grumblings that had existed since the 1800s of should we nationalise public transport in Britain continue to re-emerge and you very quickly begin getting calls again saying actually the Railway Act didn't go far enough and we should have nationalised. The next bit of legislation passed for public transport, which impacts London, actually comes in 1924. There had been suggestion in 1921 after the London railways were excluded from the Railway Act that maybe the LCC should take full municipal control over London's urban public transport. This has problems. The LCC has a bit of an accountability problem throughout its existence, and In 1921, there is an outbreak of protests and rioting in East London, um, particularly in Poplar, where there is the Poplar Rates Rebellion, which is basically saying the LCC 
is not accountable to the poorest in London, it is not acting in their best interests, and that the citywide authorities are not working really for the people of London, and that puts pay in 1921, like there's going to be no popular support for putting all of London's public transport under the LCC, and therefore that just puts pay to that as a suggestion at that point. I think that's always an interesting with the LCC as as an organisation, with governmental changes, with societal changes, these kind of big London bodies, as we know, even in, you know, in later decades, they come in and out of favour and fashion, depending on uh, different economies and different priorities at the time. And certainly by this point, the LCC They've been around for quite a few uh, years already, and they're not seeming... Yeah, it was the 1860s, I want to say, it comes in. Yeah, and so they're, as an organisation, I mean, that doesn't mean that they shouldn't be fit, but especially after the First World War, lots of societal issues, problems going on, especially in the East End of London, the poorer parts of London. And it's this idea of who is going to look after transport in a much better way. And that, I think, is where the UERL pushing themselves as this kind of responsible body. And they are, of course, set out and aside from government or from even local government. I think that 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 seems a lot more palatable at the time. Yeah. And so in 1924, we get the culmination of these talk about how do we better regulate London's transport, given it's been excluded from the Railway Act 1921, but also that we can't really, or we don't want to, municipalise it under the LCC. That's a really hard word It's a good word, I like it. It's a good word, it's a really hard one to say. And we've got problems on the trams, because following the arrival of the pirate buses, they're undercutting the trams. It's an interesting cycle, because when the trams first come along, they undercut the buses, and then pirate buses come along and they undercut the trams, because now we've got diesel and petrol buses, they are now cheaper to run than a tram, whereas a horse tram was cheaper than a horse bus. And so the tram companies respond to this by saying, we're going to cut the fares, but we're also going to cut staff wages. And as anyone paying attention to the news right now will know, If you propose cutting staff wages or staff working conditions, the tram staff on most of London's municipal tramways go out on strike in the early 1920s. I mean, that makes a huge amount of sense as well. I mean, if you're working in in any kind of transport area, wages are hugely political and politicised. And especially this kind of post First World War period, reducing wages when conditions are already kind of pretty sparse anyway. Uh, is definitely not going to be palatable. No, absolutely not. And so the tram staff go out on strike, which further puts pressure on the tram companies, because if the tram staff are on strike, well, yeah, you're not paying your staff, obviously, but you're also not bringing in any money. And at this time, one of the standard approaches to strikes was just to sack all the staff and rehire. The problem is this is essentially a general strike of tram workers and that makes it much harder to just sack people because actually you can't just sack all of your staff and hire them all in usually you just sack a depot and that's fine that teaches everyone a lesson but everyone's on strike it suddenly becomes actually prohibitive to do that because the cost of retraining and shutting down your entire network for an entire period is just prohibitively expensive and disruptive to the network and people will turn to buses and will stick there. And of course this feeds into sentiment at the time which is building towards the 1926 general strike. So we're seeing a real deterioration in many sectors over this period in working conditions and thus uh, employee relations. And so we're getting to a point where actually things are reaching a tipping point and you can't just deal with things by sacking striking workers because you'd be sacking too many, which I would point out is why we join unions and because it gives you more power. There's a lot going on in the 1920s in terms of fear as well. I mean, coming out of the First World War, coming into the 1920s, there's a huge amount of unemployment And there's a huge, when you're looking back on it, I mean, at the time, people thought that, you know, large industries were just being completely cut. There was a shift in industry and there was mechanisation and lots of changes that meant actually on the face of it, people thought, oh, wow, you know, there's there's going to be so many job cuts almost in where we are now in some kind of chat GPT world. It's this idea that actually there will be a shift. There is there is a shift in the 20s, but it is to other industries, other employment, although it does mean that there's a high unemployment during this period. 
And if we think about the changes on the transport side that are happening in the bus world, we talk about, well, the motor bus being cheaper to run than a horse bus. Well, but that's not just because horses cost money, but it's because caring for horses costs money because you have to have people looking after them. So by bringing in motor buses, you're getting rid of all that labour that's moving hay into stables and clearing out the stables and looking after the horses. Yes, you've still got mechanics and technicians looking after the motor buses, but one person, two people can maintain a lot more motor buses than can look after the horses for that equivalent number of horse buses. So this period of mechanisation, just as in the 1800s with the Industrial Revolution, back with the Luddite revolutions at the time, we're talking about massive changes in working practices and changes in employment. And as you say, growth in unemployment in some areas and there's a period where this growth doesn't happen quick enough so that people are out of work and and there are of course financial crises that go on this period is incredibly turbulent and almost unknown as well for a lot of people feeling it at the time so leading up to the 1926 general strike yes you can see the kind of seeds of that coming through this tram uh, i wanted to call it a tram revolution then but this protest against and this strike against uh, lower wages is of course justified in the sense that there must be that fear of losing employment but also wanting to keep your conditions as well. Yeah. Hello, Simon here. Sorry for the brief interruption to the conversation. Just a quick shout out to say thank you to our fantastic patrons over at patreon.com forward slash rails to nowhere. Our patrons help support the creation of Rails to Nowhere, contributing as little as just £2 per month to help fund the various costs that come with running even a small podcast like this one. In return, as a thank you for your generous support, me and Ella give you additional bonus episodes, a week's early listen to all of our normal episodes, and some extra early content and some extra content blogs. Otherwise, thank you for listening. Thank you to those of you who do support us. Thank you to those of you who are now thinking about supporting us. And let's return back to the conversation. So the government's response to this is to try and freeze things as they were, because in 1924, we get the London Traffic Act, which brings in regulations of buses. So it establishes the London Traffic Area, which is an important thing that we will touch on many times on this series, because it's what defines the London Passenger Transport Board's area and all sorts of things. Actually, even through to this day, the London Traffic Area still has some impact on aspects of TfL operation. And it's approximately a 25 mile radius circle around Charing Cross. And so this establishes the London traffic area and it establishes that within the London traffic area, the Minister of State can establish any street in the City of London or the Metropolitan Police District as a restricted street, which prevents any new bus from operating on it, which is enacted across most streets in the London traffic area from 1925. And this means you can't start a new bus route, you can't change a new bus route, you can't deviate your bus route without authority from the Minister of State for Transport. And it doesn't necessarily solve the pirate bus problem because what it does is it just locks all the existing bus operators in. So the UERL is now, their their bus arm, the Gen- the London General bu- Omnibus Company, is now locked into its services. The other big odd bus operators in the area are locked into their services. And all the private bus operators, they're all now just, that they're locked in. So it removes the flux and the chaos and sort of damages some of the disruptive elements of the pirate buses. But it still just freezes the network as it is. It's just such an odd thing to do, to just yeah. capture a moment in... In time and to say right well that's how it is and not to attempt really to try to fix the problem not to yeah. make more specific rulings on you know on, on anything on passenger numbers on you know traffic or anything like that it's just okay this is what it is and that's fine and yeah. we'll, we'll work it out it's very strange and so this goes some way to solving some of the problems but it doesn't as you say by any stretch of the imagination solve it it just 
sticks things. But it does mean the UERL now as the dominant force in multimodal transport. Let's call them that. At least is stable in its surface transport arm. So its trams and its buses are protected. But this doesn't mean that they dominate. They buy up more and more of these companies. The impact of this is predominantly that it reduces the profitability of the pirate buses, it reduces the attractiveness of running such a service, and so it means the UERL can start buying more of them up. So it does consolidate its power over time. But you've still got big organisations, you've got some municipal networks, you've got Thomas Tilling is the biggest operator other than municipal and UERL operations. And so over this period, the UERL continues to push for greater unification of London's transport. They're very much of the opinion that the end game they are after is the UERL running all of London's public transport. But they go about this, and I find this aspect of it, they they put themselves forward as the people that are safe and trusted and, and can be. And yes, they've got a record, haven't they? They've got a record of, you know, a good number of tube lines. They own most of, of the tube lines, at, uh, you know, by the 1920s. Yes. And it's quite aggressive. Oh, it really and is. yet it feels, even today, quite quite a normal thing, quite a reasonable thing, because they are the predominant they are the ones that have been running they've got a good track record they they do manage to standardize a lot of the network they manage to make they manage to make money from it i suppose it's that idea yeah and people are like yeah fine you're the most kind of trusted at once it doesn't seem unless there is evidence to suggest otherwise it doesn't seem like they are particularly reviled in a kind of they feel almost like a you know a big organization that we could look at today like amazon for example if they were to to make those same kinds of statements we'd feel very weary of them yeah like if amazon turned around to us and said we want to run your national post service for example say they turned around and said amazon wants to buy the royal mail yeah there's a lot of arguments about why amazon might be a good organization to run the royal mail from a sort of business and logistics point of view but like most people would turn around and go but we don't want that to happen for like sort of gut reasons but the uerl has set itself this public image by the 1920s that basically it is becoming synonymous with london and i think that's partially because it's so ubiquitous that's really i think where that comes in where and i know you're heading to things like branding and publicity and public relations all the time before huge kind of marketing and pr operations existed they are at the beginning they're almost it's almost imperceptible maybe maybe to the person that is traveling on these, that they aren't just the people that have always run it. And that's yeah. that. It seems very, as you say, Simon, synonymous with transport. They are the people that provide your tube service. And that's yeah. that. What awareness you would have had beyond that, I don't know. But I think it's that. It's that safe pair of hands, or at least this idea that they are the organisation to do it, that seems to make it a lot more palatable. So yeah, so in 1928, Frank Pick is appointed as Managing Director of the Underground Group, and together with Ashfield, begins a real concerted campaign to try and get legislative action taken to consolidate the UERL's monopoly because commercially they're struggling to make that happen mostly because by now realistically there's a few smaller operators but they're up against the metropolitan railway who will not sell throughout their history they just there's never going to be a chance of that is there's never going to be a chance that the met will relent in any way you've got thomas tilling and their omnibus services and again they are not going to sell because they're just so big. And you've then got the big municipal tramways. So the really big ones in London, as I mentioned earlier, they're the LCC tramways and the West Ham tramways. Those are the two really big municipal ones. There's a couple of other municipal ones, and they're not particularly interested in selling. By 1928, the underground group has managed to buy up all of the tramways from the municipal tramways that it can 
It's brought them under its various subsidiaries, uh, such as the Metropolitan Electric Tramways and the London United Tramways. And so it's now looking for a legislative framework to force the rest of London's public transport into its monopoly, which, given that that's the method that Yerkes had tried in Chicago, that it got him kicked out, is an interesting circle of history that we go from Yerkes trying to get legislative framework to monopolise Chicago streetcars, comes to London because that doesn't work, and then 30 years later, his organisation he set up is again looking for legislative framework to monopolise London's public transport. As you've just described, there's not really anywhere else they can go apart from legislation. They own almost everything on the underground. But in the early 1930s, the government say, yes, we will pass a legislative framework to unify and monopolise London's public transport, but it won't be as a private organisation. So in 1933, we get the London Passenger Transport Act passed, which is seen as the evolution of the Grouping Act of 1921, and as a test bed for how nationalisation of the mainline railways might work. Because this is a really new way of running an organisation, like big nationalised organisations didn't exist before the 1920s. No one really knows what a nationalised railway company will look like in a British legislative framework. And well, actually, the LPTB, as created, as I say, it's it's more akin to the BBC than the post-Second World War NHS and British Rail were, because it's a government-owned corporation that's free to act as a business, but it's supported and funded by the state. And I think part of the reasoning for that is because the mainline companies haven't really shown much improvement in profitability following the grouping, there's this sense the government's going to have to start supporting the railways at some point. There's definitely a realisation there, isn't there? There's a realisation that actually some funding and a shift from a duplication, profit or you know, profit-driven activities there's certainly and i think i know you'll speak about the extension to the piccadilly line from finsbury park but that idea that actually as an organization they can't really afford to build it although they know that it needs to happen and they know that there are pinch points and areas that that mean it needs to happen they don't have the money uh, as a private company to do it and it may not actually make a huge amount of profit it's not on the on the books or on paper something that looks likely that they would be able to build so that's really where the kind of government comes in but it's like a halfway step isn't it it doesn't feel it's not fully nationalized it's just a company that's owned by the government yeah and indeed some of those big projects of the 20s so things like the piccadilly line extension to cockfosters and the Morden extension to the northern line they're funded in part by government grants to try and relieve unemployment in the 1920s and again We'll see a repeat of that in the 1930s with the New Works programme, which is partially funded by money from the government to respond to the Great Depression. This is also the other problem we're having in 1933, is while the Great Depression is having less of an impact in the UK than it did in the States, it is still having an impact and the government is having to rethink how it deals with major state infrastructure projects because over this period we've seen the railways and the roads and all of this stuff become increasingly viewed as what we'd now call national strategic infrastructure. I think they're realising that aren't they and that that especially yeah. with the roads comes in with the the traffic act because they really have to make sense of some of it. It starts to become exactly. as motorised transport becomes more popular and more prevalent They need to actually start to understand how they're going to manage it. They may not get it right, but they're starting to to feel the need for state intervention in some way. Exactly. And without wanting to steal from future episodes too much, at the same time as this is all going on, we're seeing the creation of the strategic road network or the embryo of what is now the strategic road network. We're seeing routes such as the A roads. Well, in the 1930s, we see the establishment of the AB road designation system. We're seeing routes like the Great Eastern and the Great Western Way and the Great Northern Way being developed as dual carriageways within London. We're seeing the establishment of the North and South Circular as routes. So we are seeing this sense that actually the state should be taking a national approach and be thinking about how these things are coordinated. And so 
1933, they say, yep, yeah, we're going to trial nationalisation of the rail network in London. We're going to take over all of the public transport in London under a single organisation. That will be the LPTB. And the LPTB is required to buy all of the organisations that it incorporates. So I was doing some reading for this series. Yes, I've written my dissertation and yes, I finished all that. But I'm still reading stuff for this because there were things that were really interesting that I did not get to look at. Aaron keeps telling me I should do a PhD because I can't stop reading this stuff. But Definitely, I'm... definitely should. <laughs> So I think that's the thing. There's so much, even though you've done so much work on the LPTB, how it kind of came about, the, yeah. the different, the vagaries of its organisation, I think there are still huge amounts that oh, so are there to be discovered. To yeah, and to, to really understand, you know, the physicality of how it actually came about. But they didn't just confer ownership on the 1st of July. No. And it has to integrate. Yeah. So, so some of the reading I've been doing recently, if you want to look at some of these pri- these primary resources, people, then absolutely. So they're all held by the London Transport, the TFL archive, which is publicly open to members of the public. But a lot of the minute books from this period are actually on loan long term to the London Metropolitan Archive. So if you want to look through big, dusty books, go to the London Metropolitan Archive website and you can... You can pull stuff out. It's a great place. I thoroughly recommend. Yeah. But some of the records I've been looking at is some of the early minute books and you've got them talking about how much they're going to pay per share to each of the organisations. Lots of UERL paperwork for that point of view, because actually the UERL is still a conglomerate of multiple organisations. So like there's paperwork saying how much the Central London Railway is worth per share and how much the City and South London Railway is worth by share and all of these things, because they're technically all different companies. And then the massive task of integrating them. So the the, the LPTB officially comes into being on the 1st of July 1933. So almost exactly 90 years ago when this goes out. So the LPTB comes into being on the 1st of July, but it doesn't own all the stuff in London for a year or two after it's formed. Actually, it takes a little while, doesn't it? Int- it's not until properly... Things. Yeah. There's, a, there's a few things that you need to integrate. It's not until about late 34, is it? Early 35, yeah. that they properly become... And that's basically why the new works programme doesn't get properly put into action until 1936 because it takes until about 34, 35 for them to fully integrate everyone in and then they can sit down through late 1935 say, right, so what do we want to do to integrate this network? And then in 1936 they're able to publish the New Works plan and say right, these are the projects we're doing. Not to say they're not doing things as I'll touch on in slightly later episodes, they're ticking over, they're carrying on things the UERL were doing, they kickstart stuff like rebuilding King's Cross Station to integrate the Metropolitan and the UERL stations together right from the off in 1933. When I was looking, that's literally like one of the first minute books actually talks about rebuilding like King's Cross. They kick off really quickly, don't they? It's almost as if they thought about this before. Like some of them, like King's Cross and Baker Street, it feels like these are locations where they've known there are problems and pinch points and they wanted for a long time to change these things and rebuild these stations and the the moment they can they start doing it. One interesting thing I find with this of course is the LPTB initially isn't meant to be the UERL, it's not meant to be a continuation of it, even though the chairman of the UERL, Stanley Ashfield, becomes the chairman of the LPTB and the managing director of the UERL, Frank Pick, becomes the vice chairman and chief executive, essentially managing director, of the LPTB. It's not meant to be the same organisation. So initially, they ditch the roundel and they ditch loads of the iconography of the UERL and they start being like, well, we need a new logo and a new identity. And you sort of half and half get that because we get the new name or at least the new public facing name, London Transport. I love that London Transport it's letter type. It's beautiful, isn't it? I really love Rendered. It when it comes out in Johnston typeface. And actually very quickly you get get minutes that say, we're not going to deliberately go out and repaint all the buses now, but could we have all the buses and all the trains go through a regular refurbishment and regular repaint reasonably quickly to get the new liveries out across the combine? And they do start putting the letter decals on really quickly on the buses. While they initially do talk about killing the Roundel, because it's not the same organisation, so it's not the same logo, that's really established. 
I think it's it's really telling that that's only come in in I mean it it's sort of evolved in it's, it really does it goes right back doesn't it to about 1908 but the the roundel itself is not the bullseye I think as as a kind of difference to the bullseye it comes in but if you imagine they also the breadth of ownership yeah. and the places that this roundel will have been I mean all of these things are. Uh, parts of coordination and cooperation even before they come together it's about unifying the network without being under common ownership anyway so lots of these are legacy anyway Um, and and the name underground and the roundel had all been part of sort of before the uerl bought the central london and the city in south london they'd agreed that there was going to be common branding so there is a sense these things are actually cross organization to an extent and so Really, these are established identities. So the LPTB does retain the Roundel. It does retain the Johnston typeface, which is an excellent decision because it's a beautiful typeface. And it creates a London-wide organisation. It eliminates pretty much all of the all of the non-London passenger transport board services from London because even stuff that stretches out into the countryside is brought under Green Line, which is a London passenger transport board coach company and so it unifies the system it makes it truly london wide and it establishes london transport as the name and the roundel logo as the identity of public transport in london london transport would remain as the public facing name for public transport in london until 2001 i want to say i want to say 2000 i believe tfl was created in 2000 but we still refer to it. We still, very often, you still refer to it as London Transport. And the Roundel remains to this day, even though TfL doesn't formally use London Transport as its brand, it still uses the words transport and London in its name. And it still uses the Roundel in many guises now as its logo. And almost everywhere that they can possibly put it. That's not a statement at all. Um, it's great. It's a, it, you know, it's a great device and it obviously works very well. So it means in 33 or in 2000, why would you get rid of something that is clearly very recognisable? I think that it makes it much more unified. Yeah. And the same with retaining Holden as the not company but retained architect for the UERL and then into the LPTB years. I always like to make the point that Stanley Heaps is actually the company architect for the LPTB and the UERL but Holden as the principal architect for design of stations means you like with the round or like with the typeface you get this change in 1933 and this broadening but you actually still get continuation. You still get this sort of actual continuation. And this is why it's one of those strange things, because Transport for London is this year celebrating its 160th anniversary of the underground. I always like how we establish the history of London Transport as being from 1863 with the opening of the Metropolitan Railway, not from the start of the first horse buses in 1825. That's a really interesting point, isn't it? It does feel very much underground focused. I think the buses, even in our conversation, we spoke a lot about the, the buses. They don't really come into many narratives, actually. And that's obviously a big part of what I'm trying to do with this project, because I personally, I'm into this because I'm into trains and I'm into the underground but my research proposal as I keep coming back to my research proposal said the problem with transport history for London is you get a lot of monomodal so it talks about the underground talks about the buses talks about trams you get very little cross-modal study of London's transport history you get very little sort of talking about how they actually interplay off each so what we've done today we've talked a lot about how the UERL and the underground companies impacted the buses and how the buses impact policy on the UERL and sort of talking about how it sort of impacts and that's that's what I really want to get into talking about this because the LPTB is a multimodal operator so why do we talk about just underground why is it so hard to find a book that talks about the buses and the trams and the tubes collectively as a system because they are even going before that I mean we've spoken about the UER, UERL yeah. where they own a bus company you know they it very much it drives an almost the routes that are set down underground, that are dug underground, follow routes above ground. And it is usually buses, trams, yeah. road transport that's laid that out, laid those patterns out that are then adapted and changed by the underground. So yeah. it's quite interesting, isn't it, why there's that silo. And as I was saying, like, I find it interesting that we measure the history of London transport from 1863 with the opening of... Well, London transport is the organisation, not transport in London. From 1863 with the opening of the Metropolitan, not from the opening of the buses... And not 
also from the opening of actually the organisation that London Transport owes more of its cultural and identity legacy to in the form of the UERL and the birth of that organisation in the late 1800s, early 1900s, we actually go to the organisation that only really ran one line and a couple of small bus routes and had no interest in the trams of the Metropolitan Railway. It, I find it interesting how we draw, where we draw that point, because you could argue, well, 1863 is the opening of the underground, so therefore it's the genesis of that. Oh, but, but No, we've picked that because 1825, I want to say, is the first omnibus. I can't remember the date exactly. It's 1820s, yeah. isn't it? I it's think... 1820s. I wonder if it's because of the the nature of what happened, of the engineering marvel of the yeah. of the problem that was solved, all of those things that that we kind of draw back to. From a social history point of view, I think it's also because buses are a less prestigious form of transport. They are in London, aren't they? I mean, yeah. we grew up in London, so I feel like outside. I mean, where you don't have an underground network, then mm. obviously you can't reference anything else, and so buses are very much a part of people's daily lives anywhere else because that's really if you live and, and outside within, of a city even within london most people's daily lives they are but they're mostly seen as a working it's a, class and it's a, a class thing isn't it i never got I, on the tube. i think a lot of it is a class yeah i think a lot of it's a class thing i i didn't get on the tube very often i mean i, I probably you know a handful of times yeah. until i was 12 14 you know we didn't get yeah. we didn't travel very far and we got the bus that's what you did it was more expensive to get the the train or the underground yeah. So we got the bus and that was, that was, so I definitely think it is a class thing, yeah. isn't it? And so maybe that's why we look back to, to the trains and to the, um, yeah. to the Metropolitan Railway. But I think just rounding up the episode, because we've come to the end of my notes for this episode. So we're coming to the end. So I think just to round it up though, that's why this is important because we've talked about how the LPTB actually, it's about more than just the tubes. Lots of people think about it being just the tubes, but it's not. It's about the buses and the trams. And actually... As I pointed out earlier, the buses are really the principal driving factor that kicks off the whole process of getting the government involved in legislating a monopolised London transport system back in 1924. And I'm not saying that wouldn't have happened if there hadn't been buses. But in this story that exists in the history as it is written, as it happened, the buses are actually a pivotal part of that history. And in the next episode, I will again be joined by Aaron. We will be talking, I've invited you on to join a railway history podcast. And in the next episode, we're going to be talking about cars. Um, Fantastic. Fantastic. We're going to be talking, talking about the history and the development of the motor car and why I disagree with the narrative that exists in so much of history on the 1920s and 30s that the motor car was not a particularly important part of policy creation and why actually it was more prevalent than a lot of history books um like to say it was this is a hill I again i mean on. more reasons to do a phd simon and yeah challenge these kinds of underground centric or, or i am know, these narratives I'm doing it i'm doing it one episode at a time on a on a, <laughs> a, 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 on a small podcast um but yes so that will be our next episode in the meantime Thank you for listening. My name's been Simon and I've been joined by Aaron. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening. And we shall see you, well, we'll talk to you again in two weeks' time. Thank you. This episode of Rails to Nowhere was presented by myself, Simon Sarson Co, and featured the voice of guest Aaron Oliver. Rails to Nowhere is produced by Simon Sarson Co and Eleanor Ashton, and research for this episode was carried out principally by myself with contributions from Aaron. Rails to Nowhere is brought to you by our fantastic patrons over at patreon.com forward slash rails to nowhere, especially those who subscribe at our £10 and above Patreon level. Thank you very much, Valkyrie Lemons. If you'd like to support the creation of the podcast for as little as £2 per month, then you can do so over at patreon.com forward slash rails to nowhere. Otherwise, you can keep up with 
Rails to Nowhere over at twitter.com forward slash Rails to Nowhere or search Rails to Nowhere podcast over on Instagram. Until next time, thank you for listening and have a good day. Also, thank you to the listener who wrote in to the YouTube comments to comment on that to let us know that it's pronounced Geddes um, for Eric Geddes, which me and Ella were spending a large point of that episode struggling to work out how to pronounce that name. It's always great when you only see names written down. This is the curse of working in archives. You see all these names written down. You have no idea how to pronounce them. There are many words as a historian that I learned after saying them and somebody saying don't you mean and then feeling really quite silly yeah at a word yeah. that everybody just thought um hegemonic was one of those words that has just come to mind uh, yeah. but yes it's that kind of thing isn't it but Geddes it is